Welcome to our weekday text gathering. Today is day 127 in the Circles Reading Calendar, and we are covering chapter 9, section 1. We have made it to chapter 9. This is asking for what you want. This is a fascinating section that covers, among other things, the question of why our prayers often go unanswered. And another, as I was saying before we hit record, warm welcome to all of you. I do see lots of familiar faces and I see lots of new faces. So this, if this is your first time joining us or if you've been here since the beginning, we are so glad to have you here. I don't have very, any other announcements for today other than I hope that uh, many of you, if not all of you, will join us for our Reconnecting with God workshop uh, this month on Sunday, the 19th of May from 10 a.m. Eastern to 5 p.m. Eastern will be an extraordinary day of um, content around de deepening and developing our connection with God. I think it's like the 17th, isn't it? That was the 19th. Go to info at circle, no, go to circleofa.org forward slash God. And the 19th the info, would be right like there. two weeks from yesterday. Oh my it's goodness. the 17th. The 17th. Yeah. Sorry, everyone. That's what I get for, oh my gosh, that's really soon. <laughs> it is really soon. We've got to like get more out about that. We do. We do. Okay. So you guys are getting a little behind the scenes on how things work around here. <laughs> it's a really tight ship. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, everyone, um, please close your eyes, get comfortable. Take a deep collective breath together. And join me in prayer. Dear God, thank you for the opportunity to come together today as friends and mighty companions on this remarkable path of light. We surrender this gathering to you and ask that it serve your purposes and be blessed by you. Help us reawaken to the knowledge of where we are always and what we are forever. May we hear your call today from deep within our mind where you abide. Please take a moment to extend your love and blessing to everyone on this call and a moment to receive the love and blessing from all of those who are blessing you now. I bless you, brother, with the love of God, which I would share with you, for I would learn the joyous lesson that there is no love but God's and yours and mine and everyone's. May we be a source of miracles and healing, and may this world change through us. So it is, amen. I think we need to, you can, you can undo that, Emily, you know. No. Oh. Okay. Uh, on view options. Mm -hmm. Oh. Or like the, the top, yeah, there you go. Okay, we've got to lock that function. Anyway. We've got to figure okay. out when our workshops are. Yeah, the ship is looking <laughs> ever tighter, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let me share my screen. Okay, as Emily said, this is the first section of chapter nine. So we're getting there. And we've titled it Asking for What You Want, because it's really about that. And it, it goes along with the section that follows it, um, which I think we've titled Hearing God's Answer in Everyone. This section, and also the next section, but mainly this one, addresses this crucial issue, which is why don't our prayers uh, always get answered, or at least always seem to get answered? And the, the answer he gives to that question is fairly complex. I've tried to simplify it, 
but at the end, I've got a diagram that I think really simplifies it. Actually, I don't even have an exercise today. I couldn't think of one to, to apply here. Um, so the diagram is going to be kind of like the substitute for that. And hopefully it'll make everything fall into place. Okay, so if you think about prayers of yours, maybe big prayers that just weren't answered, what was going on there? Why why'd that happen? Is it because there is no God? Is it because God is very selective in helping us and does sometimes and doesn't other times? You know, what's the real reason there? Here's the answer given in this section. Okay, it begins with this foundational idea that you are the will of God. And this is said several times in the course. The exact phrase, you are the will of God, was said three times in chapters seven and eight. And the idea crops up all over the place. It's an idea I never noticed until just like several years ago. And I don't hear it talked about, but it's a, it's a very important idea in the course. Okay. So this, this section in the first paragraph says, the will of God is what you are. Well, what does that mean? The idea is that normally we think God's will is this outside will that has plans or requirements or demands for our earthly lives, and we're supposed to follow those. And yeah, it'll mean a lot of sacrifice. And yes, we might get crucified in the process, but we still should do it. It's God's will. In the course, the course talks a lot about the manner in which we were created as a spiritual being. And I, it's really surprising because you don't hear, like, like in Christianity, you don't hear talk about the mechanics of how God created you. But the course is always talking about that. And the idea in the course <clears throat> is that God stretched forth his will, extending his own being in the process, and that will brought us into being. So we are God's will. His will is not some foreign thing imposing itself on us. It's us. In our true nature, we're God's will. And that means that as an extension of his will, our will is the same as his. This is another huge idea all throughout the course that nobody talks about. You'll never, I expect, you'll never hear anybody who's channeling the author of the course talk about this because people who channel the author of the course, I probably shouldn't be saying this, they tend to just say things we're already saying. They don't seem to have their own extra insight into the course. Um, what it means is that when we, well, our will is, is mainly our desire, okay? And it seems like we want different things than God wants for us, okay? God's will and our will seem different. So we talk about, you know, not my will, but thine, um, which is from the Bible, from, I think, the story of, of the Garden of Gethsemane. But what the Course is saying is since we are God's will, that means our will is God's. So we want in our true nature, our true will, we want exactly the same things God wants. And that's the Course's explanation for why the things that are not of God never do it for us. We're never satisfied. Why? Because we never really wanted them in the first place. It's easy to think you really want something, but then when you get it, find out you don't. We've all had that experience, right? Okay, so we're the will of God. Our will is the same as his ultimately. And that means that fear of the will of God is an odd belief that amounts to fear of your own will and even your own reality. Now, everyone alive, I think, if they were really honest with themselves and observant of what's going on in their mind, everyone alive, I think, is afraid of God's will. 
we all have this sense that if we really do the absolutely good, right, holy, perfect thing, it's not going to be exactly in our best interests. It's not going to be the happy thing, right? And so we associate God's will with sacrifice, and we fear God's will. This section says, fear of the will of God is one of the strangest beliefs that the human mind has ever made. And again, the very fact that the will of God, which is what you are, is perceived as fearful to you, demonstrates that you are afraid of what you are. It is not then the will of God of which you are afraid, but yours. So the Course says that when we think we fear the will of God, we're fearing our own true will. Our own will wants and is made happy by only the pure, holy things of God. That's why, you know, people who are more spiritually awake are happier than we are. Okay, this is going to get slightly, I think, hard to follow, but like I said, the diagram is going to clear it all up. Okay, so just bear with me. Believing God's will is different than yours results in feelings of abandonment and retaliation. And there's this whole discussion, if you've read the section uh, today, you'll, you'll remember this whole discussion of the atheist and the martyr. And those are the same coupling as abandonment and retaliation. So abandonment is the atheist who believes he's alone having been abandoned by God. So this section actually suggests there are no true atheists. I mean, that's the implication, it seems to me, because the atheist may believe on the surface there is no God, but Jesus is saying that underneath that, he believes he's been abandoned by God, so, which entails a belief in God. And that was kind of Helen's situation. She claimed to be a militant atheist, but if you look at her life story, she did believe in God. She was just unhappy with God. God wasn't there for her. I mean, this is really a story about Helen. Okay, so retaliation is the martyr. And he says the martyr includes basically anyone who thinks God asked for a sacrifice. So, you know, all the churches out there are full of martyrs by this definition. So the martyr believes God is crucifying him as punishment for his sins. So these are different forms, which he basically says are closely related, and they, they always kind of go together, I guess, just in different mixtures. But the idea is once you think your will is different from God's, you think he's either going to abandon you or retaliate against you. And the first is the atheist and the second is the martyr. Okay. When you pray for things in the belief that your will is different from God's, beneath the surface, you are asking for abandonment and retaliation. I think we all at least have the concept that we can unconsciously be asking for things that we don't really want, that are painful. So look at what Jesus says here. The truth is, very simply, that no one wants either abandonment or retaliation. Many people seek both, but it is still true that they do not want it. Can you ask the Holy Spirit for quote-unquote gifts such as these and actually expect to receive them? So he's implying that somewhere in our mind, I guess the idea is that once you think your will is different from God's, you'll believe he's going to abandon you or retaliate against you. And that when you have that mindset, when you pray, something in you is in a, in a kind of a sick way, actually asking for those things, asking for abandonment and retaliation. I'm not sure I totally understand why that happens, but that's what's being said. And I think we all know that, you know, so, so much of self-help kind of assumes that you can, you can uh, be going after success, for instance, while you're secretly afraid of it, right? And you're, and you're not succeeding as kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. 
you know, in fulfillment of those unconscious desires. Robert, do you think one of the reasons why would be that we're trying to punish God? I don't think so. I don't think so. There's no hints of that in this section. And I don't, I don't think we that's part for of the picture. Abandonment in order to let it in so that we can in turn judge him and criticize him for abandoning us like we do with each other. Uh, I, I can't think of anywhere that, where the course says anything like that. Okay. So I, I think we should leave that to one side. Okay. Moving on. Yeah. <laughs> um, but we're asking this unconscious requesting of abandonment or for abandonment and retaliation is from God. So it's like the martyr actually wants on some level retaliation from God. And the atheist on some, some level wants God to abandon him. Loretta is asking if we're doing this to punish ourselves. Well, it certainly does punish ourselves. And that would be more in keeping with the Course's overall teachings. So, yeah, I mean, he doesn't really say. He's, he openly says people seek both abandonment and retaliation. We ask the Holy Spirit for gifts such as these. He says that. He just doesn't really explain why. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to just move on and leave it just lying there. Okay. You are asking for what you don't want. What kind of request is that? How sensible can your messages be when you ask for what you don't want? Yet as long as you are afraid of your will, your true will, this is precisely what you will ask for. And I think here he's talking about when you ask for things of the ego, okay? And this whole thing, this whole discussion assumes that you're asking, you're, you're praying for, for things that are basically for your ego. And what I see in this passage is that by praying for things your ego wants, you're actually praying for things your true will doesn't want. So you're asking for what you don't want. He says, you may insist that the Holy Spirit does not answer you, but it might be wiser to consider the kind of asker you are. So could it be that when we've asked for certain things that we didn't get, we were asking for something that on a deeper level, we just didn't want? Okay. You are asking for what would hurt you. But since nothing can hurt you, you are asking for nothing. And that's said very openly here. When you ask the Holy Spirit for what would hurt you, he cannot answer because nothing can hurt you. And so you are asking for nothing. And the conclusion, a request for nothing is not a request. It's a non-prayer. Any desire which stems from the ego is a desire for nothing. And to ask for it is not a request. It is merely a denial in the form of a request. It looks like you're asking for something when actually you're saying, I don't, I don't want anything. I, I want nothing. Okay, now, I, I'm having trouble tracking all that. I expect you are too. So I came up with this diagram, which I think makes it clearer. Okay, so why prayer sometimes doesn't work. And I think think we can see what this section is saying in terms of three different levels. There's the surface level working its way to the deepest level. Okay, and we are all familiar with the idea that, you know, we, we have our conscious mind, we have an unconscious mind, there are levels of the unconscious. So it's not that much of a stretch to think that our prayers are similarly multi-leveled, okay? So we start out in the top with our surface request. And in this case, th this is the assumption in this section, it's an ego goal. And I'm, I'm just gonna say, give an example, I want more recognition at work. Um, I, uh, you know, you hear me talk a lot about near death experiences one of the really classic ones from like the early 40s, which actually inspired Raymond Moody to begin his study of near-death experiences 
And he was the one that kind of, you know, put the phenomenon in the public consciousness. So this guy in the 40s, he, he's, he's at some kind of like uh, army training camp and he gets some virus and he dies. And he's on the other side with Jesus. And Jesus says um, something like, what have you done with your life? You know, that's valuable. And, and he says, I was an Eagle Scout. And Jesus said, that was for your glory. So he asked it again and makes it clear. It's like, what have you done for someone else? Um, so we have a lot of goals that are, that are like the, the Eagle Scout thing in that experience, right? Um, and we might pray for those things. I mean, how many, how many teams, sports teams, don't pray for victory? I, you know, I have my doubts whether thrashing the other team is a holy goal, right? And it's of the ego. So our ego goal in the example, and, and you might want to pick one of your own examples. Um, you know, I've sometimes mentioned how, like, I had this fervent prayer in high school that God would make a certain girl like me, okay? Now, that sounds like an ego-based goal. I'm here to tell you it was actually an egoless. No, obviously it was out of the ego. Um, so just plug in whatever your example is. Okay. Now, if it's of the ego, recognize that as I have here in the parentheses, your true will does not really want this. So you've got you've got a prayer where something deeper in your mind is saying, no, I don't want that thing. So it's kind of a double prayer. It's got different levels to it. One level negates the other, and it becomes a non-prayer. So that's that one, that, that top part. Now, underneath that, there's that hidden request that I couldn't explain satisfactorily. We have to just, I think, take it on faith. But the hidden request is, I want retaliation, and abandonment by God, because I think my will is different from God's. So there's a hidden prayer, okay? But you don't want anything that hurts you, right? How could you want something that hurts you? Um, and it's also this request for what hurts you is a request for nothing, since nothing can hurt you. So this sort of deeper middle level of the, of the prayer is also conflicted. It says, I want retaliation and abandonment, but I don't really want that. And it's a request for nothing because it hurts me and nothing can hurt me. So again, you have a conflicted prayer. Okay, and then the very deepest level is God's will slash your true will. It's what you really want. You really want the things of God. Those are what make you happiest. You may not work for them as hard, but when you get them, you're happier. Now, this is what you really want, but this isn't part of your request. Your request is for an ego goal. Okay? So, so this is a way to look at the prayers that we ask, the, the things we ask for from God or the Holy Spirit, that kind of explains why they aren't being answered. Maybe they're being at times answered just by the power of our own mind, you know, who knows. But the Course is acknowledging they aren't being answered by the Holy Spirit. Why is that? Because something in you is saying, I don't want that. And something in you is saying, uh, this is not a request because this is a request for what hurts me and nothing can hurt me. So it's a request for nothing. So hopefully we can at least, I mean, not that we have to understand all this, but hopefully we can entertain the idea that something like this is going on with our prayers. It's not about God's failure. It's about inner conflicts, hidden requests, um, a deeper story to our own prayers. Okay.
So <laughs> this is such a fascinating section. It is. It yeah. really is. Yesterday we had that discussion about why we don't follow the message of the course, even though we want the gifts that it provides. And this section seems to break the fog on that a little bit, because if we see the Holy Spirit as trying to force God's will on us, but we don't know that that will is actually our will, then we will be afraid of it. We'll see it as a sacrifice, too much effort. We'll reject it. And then we'll seek goals that seem more immediately pleasurable. So we're just all confused, aren't we? Yeah. And, and the, the big point here is when we seek those immediately pleasurable goals and we ask the Holy Spirit to help us fulfill them, there's a lot more going on in our mind than we realize. And it's that more that ultimately ends up canceling out our prayer. Well, I know you said you didn't do an exercise, but it's probably for the best because this is a section that has brought up a lot of questions. So okay. we can just well, go through them now. Let's go. A yeah. lot of questions, almost as many as yesterday, and we had devoted the whole time to a Q&A. We get ready. Um, that was my Monday. Yes, right. We did the cameo yesterday. Pamela says, what is the difference between belief the and... the 19th. Oh my God, stop. <laughs> <laughs> Pamela says, what is the difference between belief and acceptance? That came up yesterday. It did. I thought that sounded familiar. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the course says a lot of positive things about both belief and acceptance. Um, I don't think we should, I mean, I know there is a, this, this quote that says, you know, um, love does not require belief, just acceptance. But the course wants us to believe in the, the ideas that it teaches us, like love. So I wouldn't try to pit them against each other, but see them as two parts of a single process. John asks, is all fear the fear of God's will and our own? The course would probably say that. Yeah. Yeah. We're afraid. We're afraid of God's will because it seems like it's against us, not realizing that, you know, it is our will. And I think our fear of God's will has at least a couple of dimensions. One dimension is that we're afraid it's going to punish us because deep down inside we feel like grubby egos that deserve to be punished by, by God. And the other side of it is that we're afraid that that God's going to kind of like step in and as this big authority, make us subservient to him and kind of erase our, our boundaries and then we'll disappear. What happens when we pray for others and they don't seem to be answered? So we feel like we're praying for the right things, but those prayers aren't answered and what do we do with that? Well, the next section talks about praying for the right things and what happens when those prayers aren't answered. It's more talking about like a health issue of our own, but there is a section in the manual, section six in the manual, uh, and it talks about how you can genuinely give healing to somebody. And when you do, they receive it right then, but they, may not, they might not accept it right then. So it waits for them until they accept it, because if it was, was forced on them, it would do them more harm than good. Are the ego's goals all selfish? I think ultimately, yes. I think that, um, you know, egos, the course says, do sort of uh, band together in alliances. And so, yeah, e the egos do care about other egos, but for selfish reasons, only to the extent those other egos seem to support and reinforce it. Jenny, I love this question. How do we distinguish between being told to ask for guidance for everything, but in effect, we are asking for nothing? Well, from the course's standpoint, asking for guidance is a good positive request. 
okay, he's talking in this section about requests that, that are for the ego and of the ego. Asking for guidance for all of our decisions is something the Course tells us to do again and again and again all throughout all three volumes. Um, I've heard it said this mainly in the workbook. It's mainly in the text, then in the manual, then the workbook comes last in terms of how prevalent it is, but the Course is always telling us to ask for guidance for our decisions. So I, I think we absolutely shouldn't join that theme with what we're studying in today's section. They're different things. Eileen says, is asking for a partner, even a spiritual partner, always an ego goal? Well, like I said, it wasn't for me in high school. It was egoless. Um, <laughs> no, I think that... Is you know, everyone's course... goals in high school are egoless? <laughs> right. I think that the course is, you know, it, it wants us to have mighty companions. It wants us to have, you know, people that that uh, will walk with us in, in, towards a common goal. Um, that's what Helen and Bill were, and that was a holy thing. I don't think you should pray for a specific person to be that. And I think that if you pray to have someone come into your life like that, um, I think what you really should do is pray to, to learn the lessons inside yourself that will make you ready for that. I was you made my point for me to say that's where the effort should be directed because then yeah. when you do that you hit a level and that person tends to come yeah that person that person will come if you're ready and the course says that um and once they come it's going to be hard enough so like get ready <laughs> Niall says i wonder if there's a way to distinguish between our true will and our ego's will i.e. the illusion of what we think we want. Yeah, well, that's a huge topic. Sorry? Go ahead, please. It's a huge topic. I think that um, one of the things that the Course says is that the ego's guidance, its purpose is to relay to us our true will. So when you get guidance, if it's real guidance, the Holy Spirit is basically transmitting to you your own forgotten will. Um, and also, I think what we're supposed to do in walking the Course's path is constantly notice what we think we want and then what actually pays off for us. I think that's a really important educational process because we're constantly thinking we want things that when we get, we just, they don't do it for us. And, and then conversely, we're not giving much effort to other things, things that the Course is trying to have us do. And when they pay off, they're more satisfying. So I think learning what desires end up being false desires because of their results and learning which ones end up being true desires because of their results, that's a really important process of learning to identify our own true will. We do have some leftover questions, but I think we okay. should probably end it there given that you have class in a few minutes. I'm okay. Or, of course. I'm okay. No, I'm Are okay. you? Yeah, we can uh, go ahead then. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You asked for it. <laughs> so how can prayer about wanting more recognition at work be more of a true prayer? So using your diagram, for example, how can you transform that into something that's... You probably would want to pray for how you can do more good. At how you can, you know, uplift the lives of your coworkers and the people your company serves and all that. Christine is asking whether we should pray with the awareness that all the gifts that we're asking for are already within us. Well, the Course does say that we should pray, pray in the realization that everything we want has already been given us. It may not have shown up, you know, in our experience yet, but it has been given us. And so we're asking God to give us basically what he already has. And I think that's important because prayer should be done in confidence. And that, that gives that confidence. 
Catherine, I'm not sure I understand your question, but I feel the energy in it. So I want to see if Robert has anything to say about it. it says, okay. Why does wanting someone to like me hurt me? Well, I mean, basically, you know, it's an ego thing, right? Right. While we're wanting them to like us, how truly, how truly focused are we on them? on love for them, on forgiving them, on wondering what their needs are, on listening to them, you know, asking the Holy Spirit how we can be a source of miracles for them. Um, wanting someone to like us really is about, hey, validate my ego. Um, so anything that is of the ego ultimately hurts us. And think about, think about this one, right? It says, it says, well, you know, I'm not very valuable. I must not be very valuable in God's eyes because in order to be happy, I've got to have that person's ego approve of mine. It doesn't, it's not a, a, a resounding statement about our, you know, unshakable worth and God's eternal love for us. Right. That's a good answer. Catherine, I hope you really heard that because, yeah, that's powerful. Jeremy says, how is prayer the medium of miracles? How does that work? Well, what that means in that early miracle principle, um, it, it's really clear. Oh, we're back to <laughs> yeah. that. Um, it it's really clear if you read the whole miracle principle. Prayer is the medium of miracles because in prayer, we're expressing love to others. Well, how can you express something you don't have? If you don't have love to express, all you can do is fake it which is not a particularly healing thing, right? I, I'm putting on a show of, of acting like I love you. Um, and so through prayer, that, that principle is saying, we receive love from God. Okay, so, so through a, a prayer connection with God, we get filled up with God's love, and now we have love to give to others through miracles, ex expressions of love. So it's very logical. In fact, um, just as much as the Course says that giving is receiving, giving leads to receiving, it says that receiving on the inside leads to giving. So before you give, you have to have received inwardly. And then before you can receive, you have to give. So there's a whole cycle. Okay. Now we're really going to let you go so that you can <laughs> do the course companions text class today. So thank you to everyone for joining us. I'm sure we will see some of you in about 20 minutes. Yep. I will Great to see all of you. All so that we can say goodbye. Bye. 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 Thank you.